Well, it's my great privilege to be sitting here with John Moxon. Hello, John. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Shane. Yes. John and I met, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago now, and I was really pleased to meet John because he's lived with the injury for how long, John? 50 years. 50 years. So what was the date of your injury? For some reason, I can remember that. Okay. (laughs) Uh, It was uh, the 29th of April, 1970. Wow. Which, for those with a bit of a knowledge of Australian history, was the 200th anniversary of Captain Cook's sighting of the east coast of Australia. And it was, in fact, a public holiday. There you go. Uh, It was a Wednesday. Yep. And around about midday, uh, along with a few other friends, I was at Oran Park Raceway where we were setting our cars up, getting them as good as we could for a a race meeting at um, Warwick Farm the following weekend. And around about lunchtime, I demonstrated to all who were watching that I couldn't drive nearly as well as I thought I could. And I crashed into a concrete wall backwards. And I have actually no memory from about 10 seconds, 10 seconds before that incident until 24 hours later when I woke up in RPA. Yeah. They had to call an ambulance because it was a private practice day, there was no ambulance actually at the track. When the ambulance got there, um, there was just the ambulance driver and they, they got me out of the car and into the, the ambulance. And then he said, this guy's really crook. And um, I need to be in the back of the ambulance, keep him alive until we get to the hospital. And so could one of you guys drive the ambulance? And so, Racing car drivers, that's a bit of a worry. (laughs) I know. What was funny was the Airbo said to my mate, who was at the time, unlike me, one of Australia's leading race drivers, uh, he said, now watch this, mate. These have got lots of power. (laughs) And he said, I think I'll be right. (laughs) And so they took me to Camden Hospital where there were basically no staff. Because it was a public holiday, they were out on... A, uh, a fundraising walk and so when we got they took me straight into x-ray and there was no radiographer there that they, they didn't they were out walking mm. and so one of my friend's wife happened to be a radiographer and she got behind the machines and did the x-ray that identified the injury and then they transferred me almost immediately to RPA yeah so what had you done to yourself? What's your level of injury? And The level of injury at that stage um, was they classified it as C8 on T1. So I had actually full hand function at that stage. And um, yeah, that was, that was what they classified me as. That, uh, and was RPA a spinal unit at that point in time? No. No, so, no yeah. it was just a, one of those huge Florence Nightingale wards. Yeah. You know, with about 20 beds in it. Yeah. Yeah, I woke up with a doctor telling me that, um, sorry to tell you this, but you've broken your neck and you'll never never be able to walk again. How old were you at the time? I was 31. Right. Yeah. And my very first question, this will amuse some people, was, oh, so I won't be able to walk. Will I be able to have sex? Just shows you where my priorities were at the time. Well, I think it's a pretty common question. <laughs> what did the doctor say in response to that? He said, oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, erections are a reflective uh, process and that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Lying bastard. Lying bastard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> I mean, you brought that topic up and yet were you married at that time already? Yes, with yep. three kids. With yep. three kids, right. Yep. Do you remember the trauma? I mean, 50 years down the track, it's such a huge life change. Do you remember yeah, I, now the trauma that you I, experienced I did. then? And I was, I guess it's part of my nature. Um, if you had known me for longer, you would know that nothing's changed. And then I'm one of these driven people. Um, McClellan would say I have a very high need for achievement. Um, and so... I was just determined to not beat the disability so much, but continue with life and get back into it. Was I was very quickly aware that I couldn't go back to the job. Or what the type were you doing of job before? I, I was actually engineering manager of a national shoe company. Yeah. And uh, they actually came to the same conclusion. I had the accident on the Wednesday and on the Friday they arrived at 
our unit in Marrickville and said to my wife, um, well, John clearly won't be coming back to work. Here's an envelope with two weeks' salary in it. And can we have the keys to the car, please? The world has changed, isn't it? Because it's interesting today, you might well be able to go back to that same job. Sure, yes. I think I wasn't terribly popular in the place anyway. I think I was seeing it as an excuse to get rid of me. But yeah, I, I, the, looking back on it, apart from the inaccessibility of the venue where, they, where I was headquartered, um, if that had been able to be overcome, yes, I probably could have continued with the job. It wasn't a hands-on, you know, um, repair type person. It was more look, overseeing all the equipment they bought and the maintenance of it and all that sort of stuff. So was there a general assumption back then that you wouldn't return to work, that this yes. disability was meant you would spend your time at home? Yes. In fact, 12 months after the accident, when, I, when we were finally got it given a housing commission cottage in Dundas Valley, um, and my wife announced that she was going to leave um, and that she'd only stayed with me until we had the house settled. And what I did was with a friend, um, we started a business actually making hand controls for cars. So using my engineering knowledge um, in our car, in the carport, we, we did all that. And that we moved the business from the carport to a, a, a garage in um, Ashfield and then later to a garage in Campsie. That business failed. I don't particularly want to badmouth the disability organisation involved, but a particular disability organisation um, was giving me all the work. So anyone that rang them and said, I need some hand controls, they were referring that person to me. And they decided in their wisdom, after coming and having a look at what I was doing, what our workshop looked like, oh, they could do that. And so suddenly all my business referrals ceased. Uh, my mistake, you never put all your eggs in one basket. I learnt from that. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, suddenly I was at a loose end. And I went to the CES, you know, the Commonwealth Employment Service in Parramatta. And I said, I'm looking for a job. And they sort of wrote all down my experience and all that sort of stuff. And then they said, well, basically, we think you're unemployable. It's a, it's a terrible uh, thing to hear in your mid-30s. I, you know was a bit shocked by that, that I, they thought I was unemployable, that I didn't have any skills that would be useful to anybody. I did actually get a job. I found a job myself, but it was an awful job. It was sitting on the end of a telephone taking orders for um, hardware and getting the warehouse to make up the orders and send them out. It was a pretty awful job. I didn't stay in that for long. I decided to retrain. And ironically, it was a bit like the purpose of this whole exercise. I was of the view that newly injured people were not getting the psychological support that they needed to cope with and adjust and recognise that it's possible to live with a spinal cord injury. Um, indeed, my, my little catchphrase was survive and prosper. Mm. Um, it's possible. doesn't mean everyone can, but it's certainly possible. That's great. And so I decided to become a clinical psychologist and help people. And so I went to um, I went to TAFE, did the mum's matric, got the, did my HSC at the ripe old age of 40 and went to Macquarie University and did psych, uh, including an honours year. I was very lucky actually because while I was there, I had a hospitalisation at Lidcombe Hospital, which no longer exists, but... Um, at Lidcombe Hospital. And there I met a psychiatrist that they referred me to because they thought I was a bit weird. They're right, I am. And I became good friends with him and he knew that I was doing psychology and he said, would you like to spend the long breaks with me? And um, so I said, yes, absolutely. And so he allowed me to trail around behind him while he did his ward rounds and indeed sit in on some of his consultations. And what that revealed to me was that I'm, I'm not psychologically suited to that sort of work. The reason being, I'm probably too empathic. I could not leave those situations that I witnessed 
at the hospital. I would take them home with me. So I'd lie in bed thinking, shit, that poor bastard. He, he thinks the woman next door is monitoring his behaviour through the television. How's he going to cope with that? What, what, how, how does he function? What's he going to do? Yeah, they, they've said there's not really a terrible lot they can do for him. And he's living with that. And yeah, other situations. And I was worrying about those people. And I came to the conclusion that if I were the person that was trying to do the counselling, I'd probably end up on the other side of the desk because I couldn't, I couldn't do what psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors do, nurses, all of them, sort of leave that stuff at the workplace and not take it home. Um, I felt as I do now. I watch television and see people that are in dire straits and think, yeah, that's really, really bad. It affects me. So what did you do with your psychology degree then? While I was at uni, I... I in fact, there's a little video, I think I'll send it to you, that I made, where a, a guy who remains a very good friend costed me on the road and said, g'day, and then proceeded to quiz me about whether I was interested in becoming involved in the disability advocacy movement, which I'd never heard of. So nine years after my accident, in a world where um, there were no curb ramps, there were no accessible taxis, no accessible buses, no accessible trains. Um, if you went to a pub, there was no accessible toilet. If you went anywhere, there was no accessible toilet. Um, in that world, I just accepted that that was the world and that I had to fit in with it. Whereas Ian, Ian Irwin, convinced me that it didn't have to be like that. If we worked hard, um, we could maybe change things. We could get the government to see that that was inequitable and make changes. And so I became enthused with, the, with that idea. Um, with 1981, the year, International Year of Disabled People, um, coming up, the, a number of organisations were helping people to form local committees to have activities for 1981. And I, with others, formed the, the Palopia Dundas IYDP committee and um, I was president. It was um, the, the four of us or whatever they were. Um, yeah, we did a few things around the area that, that highlighted um, the issues around disability and, and access and all that sort of stuff. And that was my first foray into it. And then when I finished uni, um, Ian had a graduation party and I had already made a phone call to what was then the Handicapped Persons Alliance and had asked if there was any work and been told no, there wasn't, there were no vacancies. But at that graduation party, uh, I met a woman and she worked there and she was the woman I had spoken to on the phone. And um, she said, oh, you're John Moxon, yeah, right. And we, we spoke on the phone. I said, yes, we did. And um, she said, we don't have any paid jobs, but would you be interested in coming in as a volunteer just to, you know, get some experience? I said, yes. And so I did. And then when somebody left, I got her job as information officer. And then when that person that had encouraged me to go in left, who was the information coordinator, I got her job. As an aside, that woman is now my wife. <laughs> so she was my boss and she still is. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's changed. Um, yeah, we, didn't, we didn't get together straight away. She actually went off and married someone else. Mm. Um, and that didn't last. But we'd remained friends. And then when her marriage failed, we started to see a lot more of each other. And uh, we eventually have been together now 34 yeah. years. What did I do with the degree? Well, I worked I, after DPI. Oh, sorry. HBA changed to DPI. The Handicapped Person Alliance became... Disabled People's International New South Wales, um, which is now People with Disabilities Australia. That, that was the sort of, there's more before that, but this is not about the history of the disability movement. Well, I um, mean, let me just say while I've got you here how thankful um, I am and um, my colleagues are for the work that you did. Um, because the world is a different place as a consequence yes, it is, of but it, it was, what certainly you wasn't me. I mean, it was me and you a lot, and all a of, your lot of other people. Yeah, indeed. Have worked very hard. 
Yeah, and um, yeah, I'm proud of that. Proud of the of the contribution I've made. Yeah, but it certainly wasn't. It's not down to me, I can assure you. Of course. Um, Let me ask you just, um, I want to come forward, but just jump back a bit because, I mean, we're, we're interested in trauma and how you adjusted to trauma. We skipped over it a little bit. You, yeah, we did. You said you lost, your your relationship broke down. And yep. that's, um, you know, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes these no. events bring people together, but in your Correct. case, it caused a breakdown in relationship. Is I'm, Or was the relationship in trouble before? Yes. Mm. My fault. Um, it, we'd been married near enough to 10 years, mm. had three little kids. Um, we drifted apart. It was one of those things, we were very young when we got married. She was 18, I was 22. Um, in hindsight, our parents were right. <laughs> we, we were too young. Um, and, and I became, even now, I, be, I became... I hate to use the word, but bored a bit. You know, home life was not as stimulating as I wanted it to be, so I wanted. And um, yeah. So so, so I, really, it wasn't the spinal cord injury that caused the breakdown in the, this relationship. No, it was the it catalyst. Just, it brought it to a head. Yes, yeah. that would yeah. be my view. Yeah, and I think it would be hers as well. Yeah, and so the the spinal cord injury then became a wake-up call for you as well or not really you know what what do you think the impact no, not of the grief and, not immediately yeah no no I, I to put it into context that the two boys who were aged at the time of the breakup they were aged um, nine and seven they stayed with me and um, our daughter who was four at the time went stayed with her mother was it a wake-up call? I don't, I don't think it, it came as some kind of light bulb moment. Oh, goodness, I need to change my ways. I just sort of continued on as I was. I was a bit wild. Uh, I made quite a few friends with people in the spinal unit um, who were also a bit wild. That suits the disability so we, rights movement to be a bit <clears> wild too, doesn't it? Well, you know, we drank too much, we partied too much. Silly behaviour. Juvenile behaviour in the thirties, which is in your thirties, which is yeah, juvenile, and that just tapered off when I decided to, you know, work, have my business, um, etc. That 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 tapered away. Um, Raise your kids on your own. Basically, I, I had a couple of live-in housekeepers that were a disaster, um, and. Um, yeah, I had some relationships. I had endless girlfriends, um, and nothing wrong with them. Um, that's not well, I mean a, that's interesting because them, what you often hear is you've had a spinal cord injury. That's the end of girlfriends and relationships. So you're disproving that. Yeah, that's my experience. That it's. Um, I mean, having done psychology and now being as old as I am and looking back on things. I now realise that, in fact, it seems to me anyway, that women um, look upon men very differently from how men think women look upon men. And they're not looking mostly for, um, you know, your Hugh Jackman. They're looking for someone that they feel comfortable with. They're looking for someone that amuses them, they find funny, you know, can entertain them. Someone who is warm, someone who is um, supportive, and someone who doesn't want to control their life, um, which was what my wife's experience was with her first husband. He 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 wanted to control everything, and she just that's just not her. So there's nothing about so, the spinal cord injury that stopped you being a good date or husband. I don't believe so. Mm. I think. It's a bit like any other incident in your life. It's there, and it obviously has an impact, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, and I can understand young people. There's a young guy up in the spinal unit right now. He's 17, and he's just sort of sitting there, you know. And I feel for him. I think, and his parents are great. They're they're, they're very supportive and all that sort of stuff. But. Um, what must be going through his mind is quite 
you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult, I find, to cope with. That you think, how can you convince that kid that in fact there's a future? You know, he's, a, he's an apprentice. He's, he's doing an apprenticeship now. I don't, I don't think he's a genius, um, but he's a nice young kid with a job that he probably can't go back to. Um, yeah, and, and, and from a country town. I hope I haven't identified it, but... That's okay. Um, and so, you know, it, it, he's got a whole lot of stuff stacked against him. It will be a difficult pathway for him. But with the right supports and attitudes, he can, he can make it. Of course yeah. he can. Yeah. Um, You've shown that. You've lived well for 50 years. So when you look back on your life and you think about some of the maybe positive personal changes that you've experienced through or because of your injury... What might you identify? What 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 I has? Think, I think the most <clears throat> the thing that I've often said actually that I've probably had a better life um, because of my injury than I would have had otherwise. I think if I hadn't had the injury, although it didn't come as a light bulb moment and I suddenly changed, it forced me to change. Um, and one of the things that a real benefit is that I have met some of the most amazing people that you could possibly wish to meet. I hate to use the word inspirational um, because it just doesn't fit with me. I don't think inspire is the right word. But I've met people with extremely high levels of disability who have done amazing things, achieved beyond what anyone could reasonably expect them to. And they've done that with, obviously they were lucky, they were born with intelligence, they were also lucky they had supportive families, by and large. Um, families that didn't helicopter manage everything, but in fact let them do things and make mistakes and learn from them, etc. But they're people that have risen to the highest levels in business and academia and uh, just in life generally. And they're just super great people. And I think I'm so lucky to have met those people and had the opportunity to count them amongst my friends. And being in the disability community, I've also had the opportunity to be part of a movement that achieved things, and achieved things that were of great benefit to other people, not just us, uh, not just the people involved in the, in, the, in the campaigns, but people generally, people with disabilities generally. I think if I hadn't had my accident, I would, that whole world would have just passed me by. I would never have had the opportunity of meeting those people and befriending them and um, yeah. yeah. I feel very much the same way. And it's interesting because spinal cord injury, a lot of people stay in that spinal cord injury space, but if you can encounter the breadth of disability, it's a, a wonderful community, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, the, the, some of the people that I've met with, even, I shouldn't say even, but, but people with mental health issues, People living with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or whatever. Um, and as I said before, when I saw those people in counselling sessions, I found it really difficult to work out how they got a cut, but they do. Yeah. They live with it. And people who are deaf or blind or whatever. Yeah. Um, and people with other physical disabilities like multiple sclerosis. And I have a very good friend and I've watched over the last how long, 25 years, watched him deteriorate from being able to walk to now being, you know, really, really severely disabled and also starting to have some cognitive issues. And that saddens me. But the same bloke has done some amazing things in his life and it's just great. Yeah. And the other, I guess, thing is that I've had the opportunity because I was in those disability advocacy organisations to sometimes confront, sometimes rub shoulders with um, leaders in society, so prime ministers, premiers, uh, ministers of this, that and the other thing. Um, I've had meetings just like we're having now with them to sometimes confront them, sometimes to work with them to find solutions. And not many people get that chance. Mm. And I certainly wouldn't have got that chance if I hadn't broken my neck. Yeah. 
there's a there's a general feeling that um, sense that spinal cord injury ends a life or destroys what life was about. Did you experience some of that? Did it have any impact negatively on your sense of meaning and purpose in life? It did before my accident. I've actually been on Q and A making this statement um, that. About four years before my accident, I was having a cup of coffee with a mate of mine who had also just started racing and uh, and his girlfriend, who was a trainee physiotherapist. And by coincidence, she was on a placement in the spinal unit here at North Shore. And uh, so she proceeded to tell us, I think as a warning, uh, about what happens when you have a spinal cord injury. So all the stuff that we know about, uh, you know, bowels, bladder, sex, skin, you know, respiratory, all that stuff. And at the end of it all, I said, oh, well, if that happened to me um, in an accident, I'd rather not survive because you couldn't live like that. So that was my able-bodied view of disability. And the only time I've been, um, the only time I even contemplated not living with it was when I realised that the marriage was breaking up. Nothing to do with the disability, it was just about the marriage. Mm. And my kids, interestingly enough, um, my cousin was a um, psychologist. In fact, she was a professor of uh, psychology at Sydney Uni. She established the behavioural sciences in medicine faculty. And she used to send students out to interview me and the kids as part of their med students and universally they would report back to her she told me that the kids in particular said oh dad being in a wheelchair is really not an issue for us it's just the way he is but we really miss not being part of a family isn't that interesting so from the kids perspective the disability was not really an issue but the marriage breakup and the, the division of the family was yep far outweighed any disability stuff. The normal ups and downs of life. Correct. I I didn't really have light bulb moments. Yeah. Uh, It it crept up on me. Um, Yeah. I don't know what it does for other people, but that's that's my experience. So what has made life meaningful for you then? What's been your purpose and meaning in life? Yeah, good question. I've thought about it actually. I don't know if I've ever thought about it in those terms before. I think a lot of it is to do with my, just my personality, what I was born with and the way I was raised. I was raised to think I had an obligation to society to contribute, get a job, work, pay taxes, um, obey the law. That was basically the ethos of my family. To accept people who may look different as being um, equal um, unless they demonstrate otherwise so not to make you know prejudgments about people based on what they look like or what their religion might be or whatever Um, so it was a very small l liberal household that i grew up in and yeah women's white women's rights were um, right up my mother's alley Uh, she'd been an activist in the 20s and 30s and um, so well before, you know, well before the women's movement. Mm. And, um, or well before the one that was in the 60s and 70s anyway. Uh, so my ethos in life has always been to try and do good, do things, help people. As a teenager, I was part of a, a group that, we, I grew up in Pennant Hills in the, that's my teenage years. And there was nothing for kids to do, nothing for teenagers to do. It was, it was like a desert as far as social life went. Um, there were a couple of, uh, the churches had youth groups, but they were quite small. And so we decided to form an interdenominational youth group. So we invited you know, all the people that we knew from various um, church groups and others who, weren't even, who didn't belong to any church group. And we formed a social club. And we had monthly dances and we went on picnics and we went on boat cruises and we did all this, all really what the youth of today would say incredibly boring stuff. But we didn't find it boring. We found it 
yeah, really good. It was an opportunity to meet people and, and to mix and to talk and all that sort of stuff. And, and you know, I was one of the founders of that. I was vice president. Um, so I've been that sort of an activist since I can remember, basically. Yeah. Um, and the accident didn't change that. It changed the focus, but it didn't change mm. my attitude to trying to work with others to do good. Yeah. So I suppose, in answer, the long answer to your question, but to summarise it, probably what gives my life meaning is being able to achieve things that benefit other people, mm. and they also benefit me, I have to confess, but they, but it's, it's as much as anything about other people. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, for me, life, meaning of life, um, it's to try and leave the planet a better place than, well, I don't just mean in the green sense, but socially as well. Yeah. A better place than when we arrived. Yeah. And you've, you've lived that as an advocate. I'm curious now, um, as you're a little bit older and life's getting harder, and um, we're having this interview a week later than we planned because you've spent 12 days in hospital and some of that's life in a spinal cord injury. So how has, um, you know, what are you getting up for today? And, and do you still get the same meaning of purpose in different sort of activities as yes. life has slowed you down yes. a bit? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the things I, that both my wife and I are, are very much in, involved in and also keen about is recording family history, searching and recording family history. So we, we are very much involved in, um, believe it or not, a one name society, which is my surname, the Moxon Society, believe it or not. There is such a thing, um, but it's just a it's a, a worldwide organisation that um, is based in England. But it's just to research the surname Moxon, and there are you know twenty or thirty or something different family trees where we can't find a, a link. It's just that we all have the same surname and um, a genetic link, I mean. Mm. But that's understandable if you know anything about genetics. But by the time you get back beyond about five or six generations, there's bugger all left anyway to, to indicate that you're related. But we probably are, um, is my guess. And one of the things when you're researching your family history, if you do more than just the family tree, but if you actually go back and look at where, say, your great-great-grandfather lived, or your great-great-grandmother, or whatever, where they lived and what that place was like at the time, if you're like me, you then think, I wonder what they were like. I wonder what they thought. I wonder what their view of the royal family was, because we're all English based. What was their view of the royal family? What was their view of you know, Cromwell and all that stuff? Did they have a view? You know, were they active in their community? What, what sort of people were they? And of course, we have no idea, none, unless you're lucky enough that they got themselves in the newspaper or something for usually something untoward. Yep. Um, I'm determined not to depart this place without a record for my great, great, great grandchildren of what I was like. You know, they may not like me, that's okay. Yeah. But I want to leave a trace. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me, let me just that's, pursue that yeah. for... Um, because obviously then you're also thinking then about the character of your relatives and, and I'm, yeah. I'm interested in character now and the sort of person you've become, your strengths. When you think about your own character, what are you proud of? And, and when you think about your character for even coping with 12 days in hospital, what sort of person have you had to become to deal with that and what are you proud of in, in terms of your own strengths of who you are? 12 days in hospital is pretty... pretty Pretty minimal. <laughs> Not a lot of coping with it there. Um, yeah, you know, I went in with a UTI, had to have IV antibiotics, and probably as a result of the um, the UTI, I got this fluctuating blood pressure, and they got all excited about it and got my heart tested and all that sort of stuff. What I don't like about hospitals is you you the way suddenly you have no power. You can't determine what time you get up. 
you can't determine what time you're going to have a shower or whether you'll get dressed or whether you'll have a shower that day or leave it till the next or whatever. Um, you don't. You do get a choice of food, of course, um, but you don't get a choice of what time that food arrives. Just arrives. And if, like me, when you're in bed, you can't actually manage your food, somebody else has to sort of, I don't mean feed me in my case, but they need to cut up things and all that sort of stuff. And you have no control over that being done before the meal goes cold. <laughs> but, um, and I'm not blaming people, I'm just saying that it's a situation yeah. that they're all busy. They don't, they don't have enough staff. Um, and there are people with more important things that need to be attended to than whether I get my roast beef while it's still warm, if you follow me. Yeah. Um, so I understand that. But you still think, bloody hell, I wish I was just home where I could, yeah, the meal would be put on the table and I'd be able to eat it. Yeah, I mean, I guess what you're also saying is that life's better when you can control it to some That's degree or have some correct. say in what's going on and when it, it is occurs. for me. One of, one of my kids and one of my son in, sons-in-law and one of my grandkids, two of them actually, are in the armed services and or have been. Uh, I, I couldn't survive in the armed services. There was no way I could survive in a military organisation where you don't get to think, you're just told what to do. Um, I, that's just not me. I yeah. would, yeah. I would find, I would, they'd shoot me <laughs> within sort of week mm. for uh, insubordination or something. Yeah. Um, because so, I, I do like to feel in control of my own destiny to the extent that anyone can yeah. do that. Um, obviously. I'm not in control of my own destiny, but yeah. I'd like to be. I strive to be. So is there anything you're proud of then in terms of who you've become, the type of person you um, are? I think it's a benefit. I think, yeah, I think I'm proud of the fact that I can look back and recognise the mistakes I've made, particularly with my first marriage. I could have behaved differently and I'm not suggesting that the marriage might necessarily have survived, I doubt that it would have, but it could have been handled better, much better by me and by her as it happens, but but certainly by me. Um, yeah, that that's an issue. Raising the kids, um, could I have done a better job? You'd have to ask them that, but I think yes, probably. No one gives you a handbook on how to raise sons. They <laughs> sort of fly by. Yeah. Fly by the seat of your pants. And there are probably things that I did and said and whatever that I could have done differently and better. I like this, John, because I've asked you what you're proud of and what you... I keep bringing up things I'm well, not proud of. Well, but what you've no, done is you're, the, you're basically saying you're willing to change I'm, and yeah. you're willing to develop and recognise your own weaknesses. So I Correct. think that's, Correct. that's impressive, yeah. So we, are, we have to get near toward uh, finishing this conversation. As you look back over your life, what relationships or friendships have been important to you? And what makes them? What's made them important? Well, actually, number one is my, my wife, Margaret, my present wife. There's no doubt about that. Um, yeah, she's been, to use a hackneyed phrase, she's been a godsend. Um, she's been incredibly supportive. And... Um, yeah, yeah, we 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 go we fit together very well. By far, that that's probably my biggest stroke of luck is um, finding someone like Margaret that actually liked me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and not everyone that meets me likes me. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the other relationships that have been incredible incredibly important for me are the ones that I've made with other people with disabilities. Mm. Um, I now have, you know, a, not a terribly huge circle of friends with, with disability, but big enough, um, and they are truly good friends. Um, yeah, we have a really strong rapport. Over the last few years, yeah, quite a few of them have died, um, which has been very difficult for me. They just mm. keep dying. Um, and it's that's very hard to, to cope with. But I 
also recognise that at my age, that's part of life. You know, there's a um, Bill Cosby sketch where he's sitting there reading the paper and he says to his kid, hey, you know who died today? Um, you know, and so... Well, the alternative is to go like first, that. of course, so... Oh, no, I don't want to die. I want to live forever. Yep. <laughs> Which is interesting again. Um, I well, mean, let's, let me um, ask then, we're asking everyone this question, but and I, maybe I can guess at your answer, but who knows? If you could go back in time and um, 10 minutes before you were to jump in that car and uh, race around that track, would you tell yourself not to get in that car? Um, if you could no. change time, no. No, I wouldn't. Mm. I actually loved what I was doing. Um, people who have not engaged in any kind of, well, in, in, in that particular activity probably can't identify with it. But that kind of uh, challenge to yourself is, um, I found, incredibly satisfying and really enjoyable. It's scary at times, of course. Lots of adrenaline pumping around. Yeah, yeah but, but I'm not talking about that activity that time. I'm just talking about that in that one instance. If you could go back in time and not have the spinal cord injury again, would you? Oh, I see what you're saying. Would um, you? Oh, I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I think, bearing in mind that my view now is that it probably did me a favour and it's allowed me to have a life that is obviously very different from the one that I would have had otherwise. I think it's a better one, but you can't know that. You can't possibly know that, can you? You yeah. can't. Who knows what I might have become I, without the spinal cord injury? I have no idea. Could have been a complete disaster or I might have, been, might have gone on to become Prime Minister. I don't know. I've got no idea. Um, but I guess I, the point... And I can't have any idea, can the I? The point is you've lived a good life. I'm living a good life. It's yeah. not over yet, Shay. <laughs> good point, John. That sounded pretty <laughs> bad, didn't it? If you had to say anything to um, people who have lived with this injury for a short amount of time, um, to finish off anything you'd say to them, any tips you'd give, any encouragement you'd give, what, what would you say um, to that 17-year-old if you could spend a little bit of time with him who you were talking about before? I think I would say find something that you're really interested in that you want to do and do your very best to actually achieve that. Have a goal. You want to da-da, okay? Work out a plan. How are you going to get there? Get the people that you might need to support you to do that, if any, and see if you can achieve that goal. In other words, set yourself some goals, realistic, this idea that you can be anything you want is absolute garbage, you can't, nobody can. So there are always limits to what is possible. But try to pick something that may be very difficult, but it's what you really want to do and try to do it as well as you possibly can. And I would always strongly advise people to try and find employment in our society Contributing to society through employment is a two-way street. And it's a social contract that you're contributing to society. Society supports you in that. And so I think in our society, probably the first question outside the disability community, anyone wants to know when they meet you for the first time is, what sort of work do you do? Because in our society, that's the sort of that's the benchmark. That's their first, they want to form a view of what you're like um, based on your job. They're mostly wrong, but nevertheless, it, it's sort of embedded in our society that everybody should work and that to do so somehow gives you identity. I don't think that's necessarily right. There are many unpaid artists that contribute to society live off the state, live off the rest of society. Um, but I would encourage most people 
to pick something where it's a job. Um, if they're interested in sport, by all means get involved in sport and throw basketballs around or whatever. Um, if that's what you want, but don't make that the only thing you do in your life would be my view. And don't make having the job the only thing you do. Yeah, you, know, you need to have more than one more than one thing. But um, yeah, I, I, I think working it gives you a sense of achievement. It gives you a sense of self worth. You think I'm not a bludger, I'm actually working. Um, I'm paying taxes. I'm perhaps still getting some support, you know, maybe through the NDIS or whatever. That's okay. That, all that doing is levelling the playing field. That's not actually bludging, in my view. That's that's good. Um, but that's what I'd try to get them to consider. I wouldn't expect them to. I wouldn't expect most people to come to an agreement on that inside two, three, four years, maybe longer. In my experience of, my personal experience and also the experience of others is that it takes quite a few years to settle it all down in your mind. Um, it also takes quite a while to get around the physical stuff. You know, how you manage your bowels, how you manage your bladder, um, all that stuff. Um, is and getting used to if you're a quad, um, other people coming in and doing things to you. Um, that takes some getting used to. Uh, so we've got to give people time. And I that's one of the the things I wonder about this program. I don't know how you're going to manage that because when is the right time for people to be exposed to this sort of old bloke yakking on? I don't know. I don't know what my response would have been, you know, say six months post injury, to hearing people say the sorts of things I'm saying. I, might, I probably would have said, oh, oh, well, it's all right for him, but it's not like that for me. He's a smart ass. He just thinks everyone can do what he did. And I don't think that, actually. I'm very conscious of the fact that we are not born equal. Right. We are born into different families, with different socioeconomic circumstances, different geographic circumstances. Yeah, there are fewer job opportunities in country towns than there are in the city. For instance, there's worse transport. Um, and we, don't, we are not all born with the same personality and we're not all born with the same IQ. So, or, the, or even the same um, opportunities at school that we may or may not take it, have taken advantage of. So this idea that we're all born equal um, is just not right. And what you're born with and the circumstances into which you're born, whether you have a disability or not, will have a huge impact on, for the vast majority of people, on where they end up. Must do. It's just... Yeah. There'll but always be still... the odd person, the other, the, the president that was born in the log cabin. Yeah. But by gee, they're few and far between. Yeah. They're outliers. But we can still make a small difference to our own future. Oh, absolutely. We can make a big difference. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I'm not saying you therefore give up. Yeah. No. Absolutely not. You don't. But I think people like me need to be mindful that we shouldn't lecture people about what they can and can't do. Yeah. They will do what they can, hopefully. But I think the. I think what I'd try to do is to get the stimulate the person to start thinking about what for them is possible. Let's leave it there, John. Thank you so much. It's uh, really brilliant. I appreciate your contribution this morning.